My name is Celia Nolan, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Hingham, with members also in Cohasset, Hull, and Weymouth. We have a speaker with us today, but first a word about our organization and this webinar, which will be recorded. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. We do not support or oppose political parties or candidates. The topic of this webinar is ranked choice voting as it is proposed in question two on Massachusetts ballots for the 2020 general election. The League of Women Voters of Massachusetts has held a position of support for ranked choice voting since 2005. Today, we are very fortunate to have Jim Henderson, treasurer and general counsel of Voter Choice, now the Yes on Two campaign, here with us. Jim will give an overview of the system of ranked choice voting put before Massachusetts voters and answer your questions on the subject. So thank you, Jim, for joining us today. To submit a question at any time during this webinar, please click the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So you may want to take a moment and find that Q&A uh, on the bottom. And we will bring forward as many of your questions as time allows. With that, I think we're ready to begin. So Jim, if you are ready for your presentation, uh, the floor is yours. Celia, I am unfortunately unable to start my video at this point. So if someone can give me that authority, you can, <laughs> you can see me in living color here. <laughs> we see a very uh, fine photo of you. I, th 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 there you go. Now I can start my video. Very good. And thank you, everyone, for your patience as we conduct this. There you are, Jim. All right. There I am. Okay, Absolutely. Away. Celia, thank you so much for, for having me. I want to thank the, the League of Women Voters of Hingham for allowing me to chat about question two and ranked choice voting, answer your questions, and, and certainly get you involved in this, what we feel is a really important uh, upgrade in our democracy. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is share my screen, if all goes according to plan here. Click off a couple things there. And if I go to present, I'm hopefully hopeful that uh, everyone will see a nice large yes on two on their screen. Uh, and if someone, if you don't, scream out and we'll, we'll get that fixed. So I'm going to quickly give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. And you can begin thinking about how you might phrase questions as you go along here. i give you a little sense of who we are as an organization, uh, talk about the, the problem inherent in our existing voting system and how ranked choice voting we feel is the solution to these problems. Uh, give you a sense as to who are the people around the Commonwealth who are also supportive of ranked choice voting and then Obviously, we're running a campaign here, so share some of the ways that we uh, will hopefully win this election um, come uh, November. So who are we on the S on Two campaign? We are much like the League of Women Voters. We are a nonpartisan citizen organized, now this is different, ballot campaign aiming to bring ranked choice voting to Massachusetts. Uh, we are supported by Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and are comprised of people all over the Commonwealth across the political spectrum who see a need to really improve our democracy and how we elect our representatives really across the board. In order to get on the ballot, part of the process to get there, we had to actually collect signatures actually twice. We had to do a signatures collection process last fall. Uh, we were in the middle of it this time last year. And then we had to do a second one this spring. And we were actually the, the first citizen initiative uh, in the country to be allowed to collect electronic signatures, obviously uh, required by the pandemic, uh, but we were able to get approval from the Supreme Judicial Court to collect signatures electronically in order to get on the ballot. And we were the first uh, organization to get that done in US history. And having collected almost 130,000 signatures across the Commonwealth, we were in fact certified to be on the ballot uh, by Secretary of State. So 
in a very brief nutshell, a yes on two vote. When you vote on question two and you submit your ballot, whether in the ballot booth or by mail, it supports the use of ranked choice voting for primaries and for general elections for state and federal offices beginning in 2022. And this doesn't include the presidential or municipal elections. But pretty much every office you would vote for in a November election would be subject to ranked choice voting. So I'm gonna begin with one of the best examples of why we need ranked choice voting. Now, those of you who have friends in the fourth congressional district may have told you about this. There was a Democrat primary last month and in a nine person race, Jake Auchincloss won the race with less than 23% of the vote. This is not actually an unusual circumstance. Almost the identical situation happened in my congressional district, the third district two years ago, where the winner of that race won with less than 22% of the vote. And in our democracy, I always grew up believing and understanding that it was a majority rule. You get over 50% and that's who should win the election. But yet we didn't, the winner of this primary didn't even have 50% of 50% and won the election. Now, I take nothing away from Jake Auchincloss. He's actually a supporter of ranked choice voting, as are everybody on the screen. But as a, if you were a voter in the fourth district in this primary, the person who's going on, on to the um, general election was not the favorite candidate of 78% of the voters, which is pretty remarkable. Now, I want to highlight a couple of very interesting things here. In this race, Jake Hockenclaus won with less than 22% of the vote. The next four candidates collectively got over 60% of the vote. And as you're looking at the screen here, you might be able to figure out what was in common of those four candidates. It was in fact the four women candidates in the race. So the four female candidates got over 60% of the vote collectively. So did they somehow split the vote when, uh, as part of this process? And then I also have two candidates here who are in black and white, Chris Sanettos and Dave Cavell. They actually dropped out of the campaign uh, before the day of the primary, but after mail-in voting had begun. And they garnered almost 5% of the vote and both of them had endorsed when they left the race, Jesse Mermel. And you can see that the 5% that they garnered was more than the difference between Jake Auchincloss and Jesse Mermel. Now, there's no way for us to figure out who would have won had there been ranked choice voting. But we do know that there appears to have been vote splitting or perhaps even spoiler candidates, using a phrase that we've heard often um, in this race. And we, there's no way of knowing who the majority of the fourth district would have supported. And that's a shame. But perhaps we could do something about that. We've done some research within our organization. And over the roughly 20 so years, we find that in races where there were three or more candidates, 41% of the time, the winners of that race won with less than a majority of the vote. And in some races, it happened more than others. Some, for some offices rather, it happened more often than others. But it is not uncommon for us to go into the ballot booth, have three or more candidates, and the winner does not get over 50%. And again, that sort of belies what we, I presume we all learned again with this democracy, uh, the majority rules in our democracy. So we have a slew of problems that, have, that are raised by our current voting system. The first and foremost is it fails to guarantee majority winners. And that's a big problem, even if we didn't get to these other things. But it creates the issue of spoiler candidates or candidates who split the vote, which can alter the election outcome. Uh, any of you who have followed some of the national news out there, uh, the, the, the example of Kanye West trying to get on the ballot in a number of states. Uh, now there's no predilection that we believe that Kanye West would win the presidency, but he's being put on there very specifically, it is understood to help spoil the election for another candidate. Uh, as, we, as you saw in that fourth congressional district race, two of the candidates felt they had to get out of the race because they were worried about splitting the vote. And it, we have a system here that creates uh, that problem across the board. 
we're worried about people who um, want, who may want to offer something into in, the electoral process, but are discouraged either because they feel themselves they might split the vote or they're told by others, you really shouldn't run because it's someone else's turn. And Massachusetts has historically had one, had one of the lowest rates of contested, uh, contested elections. And so the last thing we should be doing is discouraging people from running. And then, of course, if you discourage candidates from running, we as voters have fewer choices when it comes to the, uh, casting our ballot at election time. Another interesting thing about our current system, because it creates somewhat an artificial duopoly, is actually rewards negative campaigning. If you go and actually knock down your candidate, you can get almost as much benefit, perhaps even more, than actually campaigning positively about what you stand for. And again, I, I've never heard anybody say, hey, I love negative campaigning. So why should we have a system that actually rewards it? And if you have all these other problems, voters get more apathetic. And that is the real danger to our uh, election system and to our democracy. If voters don't care, how can our representatives actually rep represent the people? So we come to what we believe is the solution to these problems, ranked choice voting. And here's the very simple explanation of ranked choice voting. You as a voter, instead of voting for just one candidate, you actually get to rank the candidates in the order of your preference, as many or as few as you want. Pretty simple that way. And in order to win the election, a candidate must earn over 50% support of the voters. 22, 23% will not do it. You actually have to get over 50% support. So the question is, how do you actually get that? Let's get to that point. So how we vote today. If you are voting for governor, you might have four candidates on the ballot and you get, and you get to pick one and that's it. And it, you may or may not like that person, but you may be told that's the person, if you don't wanna waste your vote, you gotta vote for them. In a ranked system, the ballot will look a little bit different. Instead of just picking one, you actually get to rank the candidates in order of your preference. So here you have Charlie Chang as the first choice of this voter, Barbara Berg as second, and so on. The voter gets to express their true preferences. So how do you tabulate the votes? Well, just like in our current system, the first thing you do is you tabulate all those first choices. And if candidate gets over 50% of the vote, they win just like today, no different than our current system. But what if they don't get over 50%? So here's some voting results. And these are actually taken from a real ranked choice voting election um, at, in Minnesota a couple years ago. D names are different, of course. So here we have an example where Barbara Berg gets 34% of the vote. And the first question we have to ask is, did she get a majority? Did she get over 50%? And the answer is, of course, no. So here's how you run an, uh, a ranked choice voting election. You actually go through what's referred to as an instant runoff. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the candidate who came in last place, in this case, Charlie Chang. Only got 11% of the vote. And what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate him from the process and have a, essentially a runoff election immediately with the other three candidates. And how do we do that? We look to the ballots on which Charlie Chang was listed as the first choice, and those ballots are reallocated in the second round to the second choice on those voters' ballots. So it's as if we went back to the ballot booth immediately, but with only three candidates. So again, we eliminate Charlie Chang. And what happened in this race? Well, some of Charlie's votes got allocated, actually did some to each of the candidates. Some voters liked Abby second, some liked Barbara, some liked David. And that's perfectly reasonable and perfectly expected. Now, having reallocated those votes, we look and ask the, the question again, has anyone achieved majority support? And again, the answer is no. So we once again have to say, who has come in last? We have to go through this instant runoff process again. And now David, is the person who is in last place. So we're going to eliminate him and reallocate that 29% to the remaining two candidates, Abby and Barbara. Now, 
again, you look at the ballot, and if the ballot had showed David as the first choice and Barbara as the second, Barbara would get Barbara's. The ballot would then transfer to Barbara. If the, the, a ballot had showed David as first, Charlie second. Well, you can't give it that. You can't allocate that ballot to Charlie because he's been eliminated already. So you would look to the third choice on that ballot. So in this election from Minnesota, what happened? Well, as it turns out, most of the voters who supported David also liked Abby. And by doing so, it pushed Abby over that 50% threshold, and she was deemed the winner of this election. Now, just to provide a bit of an explanation as to why that might have happened, it wasn't quite as random as one might think. In this particular race, the candidates were running for a city council seat, arguably a nonpartisan position, but the candidates did self-identify by party. And as it turned out, both da David and Abby were members of the same party. And so th there's some logic to think that the people who supported David would then like Abby second. And in our current system, even though a majority of the voters would have liked one of those two candidates from that party, somebody else would have been elected. But by using the ranked choice voting process, going through that elimin, uh, instant runoff tabulation process, we have found the person who in that community was supported by a majority of the people. And so Abby in this case was elected. So what are some of the benefits of ranked choice voting? And we've talked a little bit about this already. The first thing we have is that from the voter's perspective, you don't have to worry about voting for a spoiler candidate or, being, or having to waste your vote. You can express your true preference, but know that if your candidate doesn't come in first place, if your candidate gets eliminated, you have a backup choice there. And so you can feel free to say, hey, I liked Charlie Chang first. But you, you can also have that backup choice to make sure that your, your ballot continues in the process until a winner is determined. And it, it, again, the importance of voters expressing their true preferences, true preferences cannot be overstated. Again, too often today, voters are told that they have to sort of game out the system. They have to think about, oh, you have to vote for the lesser of two evils. And again, in ranked choice voting, those problems go away. And the electorate, and in fact, the people who get elected will have a better understanding of where their votes came from and may have a better understanding of, what, of the interests of their community. The voter gets to rank as many or as few candidates as you want. And so if you only like one candidate, you're not being asked to vote for more than one. But you can, again, rank all, as many candidates as you want in, in the order of preference. And certainly with more people running for office, it gives you the voter more choice and certainly a stronger voice in your government. The election process, again, is similarly improved here. Again, winners have majority support. So when a person gets elected, they can go into whether it's the legislature or into the governor's uh, office or what have you, knowing that they have the majority support of the people in the, in the district or the state or what have you. And that's really important. The candidates don't have to worry about the vote splitting issues. It allows more people and perhaps some uh, new people to run for office. I mean, one of the things about our current system here is that with the, with the issues of gerrymandering and money and politics, again, voters have, have been given an impression of who they, um, who's capable of winning an election even before people nominate themselves. If people um, with the rank choice system feel even if they don't think they may have as much financial support or they're worried about the, the, the nature of their district, they can still run because they know that the voters will be voting their true preferences. And if you have a good idea, we have new people, whether it's more women candidates or candidates of color, it would all be an improvement upon our current system. And so the flip side of what I talked about earlier is that there are incentives to find common ground among candidates. If you are running for office, certainly you want number one votes, but those second and third choice votes may be the uh, difference between whether or not you win or lose. And so you're not going to hammer negatively 
at the candidates whose supporters you might be courting, you might say, hey, Mary Jones and I have very common viewpoints on these, these topics. So I certainly want you to vote for me first, but hey, if you like Mary Jones first, at least make me your second choice because we have these similar viewpoints. And this is actually borne out in a couple of ranked choice elections where we have seen candidates, competitors for the same office actually campaign together. We've seen it in Maine, we've seen it in San Francisco and probably other places as well. And it's really remarkable where people are finding what they are campaigning for as opposed to simply campaigning against something else. And that's refreshing, at least in my opinion. So having talked about ranked choice voting and some of the benefits, give you a little bit of a, a viewpoint of who our organization is. So on the screen here, we have some, we've actually added some names, some of the honorary co-chairs to our campaign. And it is a, an impressive bipartisan group. So we have both Duval Patrick and Bill Weld, two different governors of the Commonwealth from different parties, members of our, of our uh, members of our, of our chair of our board here. We have Larry Summers, former uh, uh, Treasury Secretary. We have Tanisha Sullivan, the president of the Boston Double NAACP. Uh, Steve Paliuka, one of the managing partners of the Celtics. We have members of the House of Representatives here in the state. Again, Kerry Murphy, former Lieutenant Governor, Danielle Allen from Harvard. Really, pre I mean, fantastic group of people from a very diverse set of backgrounds who've come together to support this really important change in our democratic process. But beyond the, the group of um, co-chairs, we have people um, and organizations, again, across the Commonwealth who've come out in support of ranked choice voting. We have both senators, Ed Markey and Elizabeth Warren. We have virtually all the members of our congressional delegation who've come out in support of question two. Uh, Attorney General Maura Healy. Yes, indeed, you can see in the bottom left there, Secretary of State Bill Galvin is in support of ranked choice voting. We have lots of members of the legislature. We have mayors across the Commonwealth, fantastic organizations. Yes, including the League of Women Voters for which we are most grateful for their support. Um, and endorsements from the Democratic Party, Green Rainbow Party and Libertarian Party here in Massachusetts. So a really broad range of support, um, multi-partisan support uh, for which we are again, most grateful. So as we come to the, so the end of this, uh, presentation here before we get to your questions, and I can't wait to hear them. If you are in support of question two, how, what can you do to help us get over the finish line now less than a month from today? Well, we have lawn signs around the Commonwealth. There's a URL there uh, if you're interested in getting a lawn sign to put out there down on uh, in the Hingham, Cohasset, Hall area. We'd love to get more signs down there. Uh, we have lots of opportunities for volunteers, whether you want, whether you want to do phone banking, text banking, uh, write letters to the editor, all those are, are welcome. And yes, of course, there's also a financial component. As Celia mentioned, I am the treasurer of the campaign, so I, I have to mention that as well. So with that all said, I've gone through my presentation here, hopefully give you some food for thought as to how um, ranked choice voting works. Now, I'd love to hear your questions. I will take this question off the, uh, uh, take that slide off. And I'd love to uh, hear your questions. And I think that um, calls for Celia to uh, help me out here, I believe. All right, I am back. Jim, thank you so much. That was very informative. I think this is really gonna help people as they consider this important topic that our Massachusetts voters um, can choose to adopt or not adopt um, this election. And also to get a little view into the process of this true citizens petition, um, getting on our ballot with you know over 100,000 signatures. So there are some questions that are ready for you. And ready. I invite everyone now, as you, now that you've heard this presentation, um, if you think of anything you would like to put directly to Jim, this is a wonderful opportunity um, to really hear um, from the inside of the campaign. So you can use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I will start with one question here is, is it possible, can a voter list the same nominee in all the slots allowed on the ballot? Well, nothing's gonna prevent you from doing that, but it doesn't do any 
benefit because if you vote for Mary Jones first and second and third and fourth and fifth, well, as long as she's in the running, that first vote will always be in play. And since that, if she continues, if she hasn't been eliminated through that instant runoff process, your first vote is still there. But the moment she gets eliminated, it's not as if she gets to come back because you've named Mary Jones as your second, third, or fourth choice. So there's no benefit to that. You, you're not, it's not a cumulative voting. It's not as if you're vote, getting to vote for Mary Jones five times. And so you are much better off if you have other preferences to list other people as your second and third and so on choices. You cannot hurt Mary Jones by having people listed second, third, or fourth. Uh, there, there are other voting methods where um, bullet voting comes into play, where if you choose somebody, um, listing somebody else as a, as a second choice could hurt your first choice. That doesn't happen with ranked choice voting. So yeah, you could, but there's no benefit to listing your, can your chosen candidate um, more than once. Thank you. The next question is, you had mentioned the races that uh, are in scope yep. for ranked choice voting on question two. Is this something that local communities could adopt? Well, so just to be, uh, make clear that the question two only applies to state level elections. It does not apply to municipal elections. Uh, there have been bills presented to the legislature that would provide for what's known as a local option. So today, um, there are municipalities in the Commonwealth that do use ranked choice voting, and it has come through, uh, happened through a couple different ways. Cambridge has actually used a form of it for almost 80 years. Um, Amherst and East Hampton have recently adopted it due to changes in their city or their city or town charters. But currently, if a if a municipality wanted to use ranked choice voting, they'd have to go through a home rule petition with that the legislature would have to act upon. The local option bills that have been presented to the legislature would get rid of that home rule obligation and allow municipalities to choose on their own without having to go to Beacon Hill um, to adopt ranked choice voting. So that would be the mechanism right now to do that. Hopefully, if we are successful with question two, that the legislature will take it upon themselves to go ahead and enact the local option bill to give municipalities the same options as we've, we would have just given the, the, uh, the state folks. Related question with a broader focus now, is there a move to adopt ranked choice voting in national elections? Well, again, when you look at national elections, if you're looking at federal offices, Ranked choice voting under question two would apply to the U.S. Senate races and the um, and the members of Congress. So on that level, if you would consider that a national election, it would apply. If you're talking about the presidential race, uh, certainly up in Maine, they have now uh, amended their original ranked choice voting bill to apply to the presidential election. So in Maine, right now, the only other the only state that has it on a statewide, statewide basis, they will have a ranked choice ballot for president this year. Uh, we would certainly love to see that. I would love to see that. Um, it's not part of, this, uh, part of this ballot measure, but because we will have four years between now and the next presidential election, if we feel that it's gonna work well, hopefully we'll get the legislature like what happened up in Maine um, to, get it, to get it used for our next presidential election. If one is talking about applying ranked choice voting across the board, and essentially without um, reference to the Electoral College, obviously the Electoral College is an is a issue that has to be addressed on its own. In order to apply ranked choice voting on a national level, which again would be fantastic, will require a lot of uh, technology upgrades uh, in order to allow truly everyone's vote to be equalized. But obviously that's a, Again, there's a, that's a multi-pronged issue. So I'd love to see it. Um, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can get to that point somewhere down the line. Very good. So here's a question about the election results. When the results are posted and the winner is announced, would the results break down how many votes were cast for the first, second, et cetera, placing candidates? Uh, so there, there are two types of answers to that question. So let me answer the one the question is, will, will voters get to see 
how each the, the tabulation each round happened. So how many how did the votes transfer from one candidate to another uh, from um, round one to round two? And in every ranked choice uh, voting jurisdiction right now, the, the voting authorities have been publishing the, the results of each round. So you can see how the tabulation happened from round one to two to three to four to five, however many rounds there are. And so we would certainly expect that to be the case here. If you're asking about being able to see how each vote went from person to person, uh, in the last couple ranked elections that they've had up in Maine, the Secretary of State has actually published the result, published every ballot, now not who cast it, but basically a spreadsheet showing every ballot in that, uh, in the pertin pertinent district. So everyone could see exactly how the process went. And so everybody, uh, anyone in the world could actually replicate the tabulation process. And so I would certainly expect and hope that the Secretary of State would follow that lead and allow people to, uh, to do that same thing, to see, to see all the votes, see how they actually went from person to person, candidate to candidate, as it were. It's an interesting strategy question here. Why don't the RCV talking points uh, ever emphasize that ranked choice voting prevents the candidate who is least liked by the majority from winning the election? Well, I think it's just a flip side of, I mean, requiring that the person to win the election gets the majority. And so, I mean, one could say, I mean, if someone gets only 10% of the vote, I mean, they're going to be least liked by the majority. So it's perhaps a little bit more nuanced, just recognizing that, um, I like again, I'd rather present it in the positive way, that who is the person who does get the majority as opposed to all the other candidates who, who didn't. So I think it's a function of how, how one wants to emphasize uh, the, the topic, whether you want to promote it from the positive viewpoint, which tends to be my perspective, as opposed to the negative, we're not electing the person who's not liked by the majority. So interesting question. Yeah. Uh, so here's a, here's a question. Someone wrote an editorial by Hirsch and the Globe suggesting that blue collar voters will be disenfranchised because they will find ranked choice voting more complicated. What's your comment to that? Well, I mean, ranked choice voting is not new here. Someone said, oh, is this a new concept? Well, again, it's been used, as I said, a form of it in Cambridge for almost 80 years. It's been used in municipalities around the country now for a number of election cycles. Maine has now gone through a couple election cycles using it. Um, if one wanted to look at, um, I see a question here, so I'm, pre I'm anticipating it. Australia and Ireland have been using ranked choice voting for a century at this point. And so the question, the point of blue collar voters, I mean, I guess the question is, what, what's the implication there? That blue collar voters are less intelligent? I have a hard time agreeing with that underlying premise here. We find that people in each of these jurisdictions, again, whether it's the municipalities, whether it's the Minneapolis and St. Paul, San Francisco, Oakland, um, large cities that have used it, whether we look at the, um, the, the use of RCV in Maine, perhaps the best way to determine whether or not people understand it is whether they actually rank the candidates. And we find that an overwhelming number of voters, way more than a majority, can figure out how to rank their candidates. And so the idea that blue collar voters are somehow unable to figure this out, just belies what we have found empirically, just by the number of people ranking candidates on their ballots um, and, and participating in the process. We look, again, I'll, I'll point to Minneapolis and St. Paul, both jurisdictions that um, adopted rank choice voting for their municipal elections in the last 10 to 12 years. And they had historically had uh, voter participation dropping ever since the, uh, the institution of ranked choice voting, voter participation has gone back up. So meaning that more voters are actually getting engaged in the process. And so I just, I guess I disagree with the premise that there are people who um, at the end of the day are not smart enough to figure this out. We all know our favorite ice creams. We also all know our second favorite ice cream and third favorite and so on. We do ranking all the time. And I think in a, an engaged electorate, and I think the folks, the people of Massachusetts are that way, 
will engage with the candidates and, and will be able to figure out who their first, second, and third choices and who will be, and be able to actually present that when they cast the ballot. You had noted there is a question about Australia. So Australia yeah. has been using ranked choice voting for quite some time. And the question is, how has that worked out for them? Well, as I said, they've been using it for a century at this point. And what you find is that you'll find there are more parties engaged in the process because as, um, as people have, as voters have been able to vote their true preferences, it has given rise to more political parties, which again, I don't think is a bad thing here. And because you can stand for something and, and make that sort of the, the, bell, the bell mark of your, of your candidacy, um, but it doesn't need to be done at the exclusion of other parties. Um, and so again, the voters in Australia have lots of choices to, to, to draw from. And I think that's perhaps one of the best things about it. And again, I'm sure there are people who will complain about it there, um, but it has survived an awful long time to get to this point. I, I want to roll this into a comment about the Senate race up in Maine right now, and without taking that, without trying to express any preferences here. But for those of you following it, there are actually four candidates in the US Senate race. So you, you all heard about Susan Collins and, and, uh, oh, and of course, I now my mind blanks on the other Democratic candidate, but there are four, um, Sarah Gideon. But there are two other candidates, both running as independents, and they have different viewpoints. One is a more conservative leaning, but environmentally uh, conscious candidate. And one is a green leaning candidate. And the green candidate has very vociferously expressed her preference and support for Medicare for All and the Green New Deal, something which Sarah Gideon has not done quite so much. And so it allows the voters there in Maine, if they so choose to vote for Lisa Savage, the, the Green candidate, uh, and express their preference if they have it for Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. Now, Lisa Savage may not win, but if a lot of those votes didn't get transferred to Sarah Gideon, and if it were to turn out that Sarah Gideon wins that election, the fact that we've had these independent candidates who can go out there and present particular viewpoints, Sarah Gideon would know that her, a bunch of her voters cared about those issues and could then serve in the Senate with that knowledge. Right now, our current system sort of masks that. And ranked choice voting will allow a better insight as to the wishes of the electorate. And I think you will see that in Australia with the number of parties they have here, there. And hopefully going forward, we will have, again, more candidates, whether they're from the same party or different parties, that will, again, better, give us a better window into the interest and in what's important to the electorate as a whole. You had mentioned that voter confusion is not really a concern, but the question here is, is there anything to the suggestion that after a voter's top choice, they might just randomly fill in subsequent ranked choices, arguably still negatively affecting the results or the allocation of their vote? Because it seems like voters really should be urged to only rank voters they truly, only rank candidates they truly support. Well, I mean, at some point we have to trust the voter in the sense that we are putting out there that, I mean, currently we have to trust the voter that they're expressing their preference when they cast the ballot today. If they cast a ballot for only one, and again, it doesn't help them to be random. It's, you don't say, all right, if I like Mary Jones first, um, but somehow I just like Fred Smith, you're not going to help or I mean help your own preferences by saying, right, now I'm going to put Fred Smith second because I'm playing some really fourth dimensional chess here. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's actually way simpler. Vote in order of your preference. The, if, you, if you vote randomly, again, that would be the voter's choice. I'm not going to question a voter for doing that. Um, but at the end of the day, like with ballots today, we have to I mean, we have to listen to what the voters say. So I guess I'm not concerned about a voter um, 
going in and sort of randomly voting for people because at the end of the day, they're still going to express a first preference, which is what happens today. And that if they randomize it beyond that, they're expressing a preference. And we can't ask the voter whether or not was it, I mean, is that what you really intended? It's what they cast. So I guess I'm not worried about that. Um, certainly not at the level that it impact elections because if, I mean, if everyone cast random ballots, well, we might get a random result. Are we expecting that to happen? That people will, that so many people will be random in that regard? So I guess I'm not too concerned about that being an impact on election much like the issues of voter fraud are just not, there are not enough cases of that to, under, to see that impact the actual outcome of a race. Speaking of the impact of a race, you'd mentioned that we, won't re we can't really know what the result of the District 4 election would have been we, because right. we didn't have ranked choice voting. We have one person looking back to 2000 asking if ranked choice voting happened into the 2000 presidential race how would the result have changed? Do we have any data on what that would have been like? Right, so I, I can offer the following. And again, the, the obvious focus on the 2000 presidential race is what happened in Florida. And we had the issue of um, in George Bush and Al Gore being very close in that election, 537 vote difference. Yet Al, but there was also the third candidate, actually multiple candidates with the highest of the remaining candidates was Ralph Nader, who garnered almost 100,000 votes. And the, and certainly much, much larger than that 537 vote difference between Gore and Bush. And there was a, there were exit polls taken to at, that asked people, if you voted for Ralph Nader first, who would have been your second choice? And roughly a quarter of the voters didn't have one. Okay, that's fine. Interestingly, roughly a quarter of the voters had George Bush as their second choice after Al Gore. Okay, but roughly half the voters expressed that their second preference would have been Al Gore. And so if you take that 100,000 votes, if you add 50,000 votes to Al Gore and 25,000 votes to George Bush, then you have a different outcome in Florida and you have a different outcome in the presidency. So again, it's speculation, but we, we did have that exit poll data there. So we do, we can extrapolate a little bit that there would have been a different outcome had there been ranked choice voting um, in Florida at that time. Interesting, we'll never know, but it's interesting to think about it. Yeah. Um, here's a question uh, about the implementation impact of ranked yep. choice voting. Presumably all municipalities are gonna to have to buy computer software to manage this process. Should we worry? And I did note you mentioned cost earlier. So I'd like yeah. to could particularly address that too. Sure. So let me start off with this. The bulk of the voting machines in the Commonwealth are capable of reading ranked ballots. So, uh, and in every election, in every election at the municipal level, the voting machines have to be programmed. And so the difference in the cost in the municipality that has a machine that can already rank ballots is gonna be negligible because you'll have to do that same process regardless of the type of election. Now, there are machines in the Commonwealth that cannot read ranked ballots. And they are almost universally some of the oldest machines and are due to be replaced anyway. And in fact, there's actually money that was allocated to the Commonwealth through the Help, of Help America Vote Act that's sitting in the bank waiting to be spent exactly for this sort of purpose to upgrade voting machines. And so in the municipalities that um, don't have ranked ballot capable machines, it's time for them to upgrade anyway and this would be the, the requisite nudge to get them to do that. And so there would be no new uh, expenditures of money that's not already allocated. The money that's already come from the federal government to take care of that cost. So the, the, the major cost of upgrading machines should be covered by those funds. The, the marginal costs of uh, programming machines on a year to year basis, that's something that municipalities deal with today anyway. So we're not gonna have a major impact financially um, by going to ranked ballots. 
Thank you. You gave us some background on your campaign, your organization, um, but who is suggesting that we vote no on question two and what reasons do they give for doing so? So I will answer that honestly, because that's what I do. So there is a committee out there uh, that formed at the very end of August, uh, committee uh, that was formed through the Office of Campaign and Political Finance. Uh, their arguments uh, have tended to follow the it's too, it's too confusing path, um, which again, I think belies the, uh, I think the, the, both the intelligence and the, uh, the participation of Massachusetts voters. And so that's what I'm seeing, that that's really the main argument I'm seeing out there that it's just a, it's too confusing, all that. There have been arguments that have been made about um, are people disenfranchised somehow if you don't rank more than one candidate? And in fact, that was an argument that was presented to a federal district court up in, up in Maine uh, earlier uh, this year. And that argument was tossed out as a, uh, was not a reason why ranked choice voting could be found, if it were ever to be found, unconstitutional. Um, and the reality is that our current ballots right now only allow you one ballot vote. And if you as a voter only want to cast a single vote, you don't want to rank candidates, you are absolutely free to do that. It's no different than our current system is now. And so what ranked choice voting allows is it allows everyone to cast those ranked ballots should they so choose. And so it's hard for me to see that people are disenfranchised by ranked choice voting. We're actually improving the enfranchisement because we're giving people a better opportunity to participate in their election, make sure their ballot counts until a majority winner is actually determined. And so again, I suppose I'm not completely objective about it, but I am not convinced by the arguments made by the folks who are against ranked choice voting here um, because it's some of the same tropes that we've seen about, again, confusion, what have you, that are just not borne out in reality. Yeah, and specifically to that, we've received our voter information booklets and uh, in the no response, it said that people would need to, that's right, that people would need to guess at how the election would go and that that would be part of the consideration when filling in their ballots. How would you respond to that? Again, the, 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 it's, it's an utter red herring in, in my opinion. The, the concept of guessing is it's, you're expressing your preference. Again, right now we have to guess in the sense that in, without the ability to um, take the money in, where you have to take the money in or you have to take the large party issues in mind, we're already guessing who can win. And so again, we're told if you, if, you, if you cast the vote for the wrong person, you'll be wasting your vote. So we're already having to play games with our votes under this first past the post system. Whereas in the ranked system, again, the voters are actually expressing the preference. And they, they, they say, listen, if I like Mary Jones first, that's great. But then they can express the preferences. I have, there are three other candidates. Who do I like amongst those? All the candidates are on the ballot. There's no guessing. It's not as if some phantom, ballot, phantom candidate is going to show up on the ballot after they cast it. So there's no guessing involved here. Again, where we encourage people to express their true preferences at the end of the day, the ballots are most likely going to be tabulated with most people's votes um, tabulated in that final round to determine a winner. So there really isn't a guessing process going on here. You know all the candidates, learn about them, vote for them. With the increased mail-in voting this season, there's been a lot of talk about election results being delayed. Yep. With ranked choice voting, is that also, would that also be a typical impact? I, I would certainly expect that there would be some some delay in the sense that the first step of the process is, is to count all the first choice ballots, just like we do today. So we will know upon that first tabulation, um, whether or not we need to go to a rank, ta uh, rank tabulation down the road. And there will be a process by which you, if, if the answer is yes, and let, let's picture the, the hardest option, so to speak, a statewide office like governor. 
Well, we do have to bring all the, all the ballot data to one location to do the tabulation because we'd be doing the ranked tabulation on a statewide basis, all however many millions of votes. So it's a little more complicated. When Maine did it the first time, they actually had to actually get all the ballots together to a single location. I think it was in Augusta. And it took about a week to get the ballots from each jurisdiction to get them certified and get them put into a computer program. And that, but once the, the, once the tabulation began, it took about 45 minutes. So the tabulation process is not going to be the delay. It, the delay is going to be getting all the ballots to a singular location. But I am hopeful, and again, this is my confidence in the good people in Massachusetts, that we've got some really good minds, some good technology minds that can work on that problem to find ways that we can safely and securely, and I can emphasize that so many times, safely and securely transmit that voter data to a central location. And our hope is that we can really reduce the amount of time to a really negligible one to get that data transmitted. I think we can do that. Uh, and we've certainly worked with the Secretary of State's office to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, will there be some delay? Sure. But I will point out that there was a, again, there was a, uh, there were elections in the last, um, last election term where that took longer to do the counting in the first round than it took Maine to do the rank tabulation up in the, in the second congressional district. And so I think particularly in the era of mail-in balloting, we're going to have to embrace the idea that we're not going to get instant gratification on an election night. But I don't foresee ranked choice voting to be uh, the, the problem that drags elections out. And again, I'll give the following example. In the third congressional district, I re referenced this earlier, we had a congressional race where we had two candidates at the very top, much like in the fourth district, but they actually had to have a recount in that election, in the primary. With ranked choice voting, we might have gotten rid of the need for the recount because rather than having, rather than taking 60% of the votes and throwing them out, there might have been enough votes reallocated to one of the top two candidates um, to get rid of the need of the recount. And so the ranked choice voting actually may, um, solve some of the delay problems that we might see in close in what are currently considered to be close elections. You mentioned Maine. There was a constitutional challenge to ranked choice voting in Maine. Uh, is that anything that would apply here in Massachusetts? So there have been a couple different types of constitutional challenges. So I referenced the court cases in front of the federal district court up there in Maine. That, those stemmed from the uh, race in the second congressional district uh, two years ago. And the arguments made before that judge were all um, addressed uh, under the federal constitution. And every time the judge found that ranked choice voting is constitutional according to the federal constitution. So I, I'm going to start off with that saying there are no federal constitutional issues based on the rulings out of Maine and other states um, in, in prior years. The, the issue that came up in Maine that did result, have a result there, was an argument that a very particular uh, part of the Maine Constitution that requires for the election, for the election, not the primaries, but the election of state officers, you needed, it requires a plurality of the votes. And the Maine Supreme, Supreme Judicial Court found uh, with questionable uh, arguments, in my opinion, uh, found that plurality and ranked choice voting were somehow incompatible. And so they, they had an advisory opinion saying that uh, ranked choice voting could not be used in state elections, not federal, but could not be used in state elections in the general election. So currently in Maine, you can use RCV for all primaries and can be used for the election of um, federal officers, i.e. US Senate or members of Congress. So that's what happened up in Maine. So the question that has come up is, does that problem arise in Massachusetts? Well, Massachusetts has a similar constitutional um, provision that talks about the requirement to get the highest number of votes. Now, there is already a court case um, in Massachusetts a number of years ago uh, that was ad addressing the, the ranked tabulation process in Cambridge. 
and the Supreme, Supreme Judicial Court here found that that process, while not directly applicable to the uh, constitu constitutional provision, was compatible. So we already have a court case saying that ranked tabulation is consistent with highest number of votes. But on top of that, this ballot measure um, explicitly defines the term highest number of votes. So that term has not been otherwise defined in court law, in, in case law, or by the legislature. And so any constitutional challenge to our ballot question would have to somehow show that our definition was unconstitutional. And that is a very high hurdle to, to cross. And quite frankly, we don't expect anyone to be able to. So we feel quite confident that uh, if, there, if anyone wanted to bring some sort of constitutional challenge that we would be successful on it. You had a pretty interesting slide of your board showing that you have members from different political parties on it. Yep. Is there any evidence that ranked choice voting once implemented would help one party over the other? Ranked choice voting, again, let's get it down to its most basic form. It allows the person with majority support in whatever the district it is to win the election. So it's not designed to help a party. It's really designed to reflect what the community wants. And so arguably, if you have a district that is predominantly Republican, might it help a Republican candidate? Sure. If you have a district that's predominantly Democrat, Democratic, it might help them, but it's, it's truly party neutral. Uh, and so you really have to look at what does your community want? And isn't that the point of what we should be doing in our elections anyway? What does the, who does the community support? And so it, it is not designed in any way to support one party over another. It is there to support who the community wants. Um, the, the, the corollary I will say there, and I have alluded to this earlier, is that it will help third parties and independent candidates to get heard more. They may not win, but because the voters will be free to vote their preferences. Again, we'll have a better sense as to how many libertarians out there, how many green candidates there truly are out there in, in, the, in, the, in the district in question. And that might, again, help advise the person elected as to how they should govern when they get into the state house or to the legislature or into Congress. And that's really important. So, you, and who knows, we may get over, I mean, I, my prediction as I've shared with folks is that over time, and it may take a generation, third parties will develop stronger benches. More people will decide to run as part of a, as a third party candidate and have really good ideas and will catch the fire of the, uh, of the district in question. And they will at, start, at some point start winning, but, but it won't be because of them being a party. It's because they will have actually gone out and earned that majority support with their ideas and what they stand for. Not so much because of the, of the party that they're affiliated with. Well, that's a very interesting vision of uh, voters really having uh you know, potentially more representation or more variety. Yeah, more so, voice. <laughs> so, so thank you for sharing that vision with you. And uh, we'll have a chance to decide if uh, we think that's right for Massachusetts. Um, so actually my last question is from me, which is what would be the next steps? What should voters know? How did they get in touch with you? What's next for this campaign? Well, what's next is Four weeks to go for tomorrow. So we are out there. We've got, as I mentioned earlier, we've got great volunteer opportunities for folks who want to get involved. If you go to yes on to rcv.com slash signs, get a yard sign. We've got lots of them up around the, the Commonwealth. We'd love to get more uh, to show support again in every corner of, of this great state of ours. Uh, if you have questions for me, I am glad to answer them. You can contact me by, by email at jim at yes on to rcv.com and glad to answer your questions if i don't know if you're listening in from anybody out outside of that great hingham cohasset hall weymouth area uh, but if you are and you would like to have me or one of my colleagues come in and speak to any group that you have happy to get on zoom um, 
someone asked me recently at another presentation, was I happy to be able to do these from my office? And while it's certainly convenient, I actually miss getting out and talking to people in person. So it is, a, it is not the perfect opportunity to actually talk out and reach out and touch someone, so to speak, but glad to talk with whatever group of voters out there that might have questions. Um, and by all means, vote, 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 vote. And I hope you'll vote yes on two. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for making yourself available um, to everyone to have many interesting conversations. And I want to thank everyone who joined for your interest in this subject and for being well-informed voters. Um, this has been a presentation by the League of Women Voters of Hingham. To find your local league, go to www.lwv.org. The recording of this webinar will be available far beyond Hingham and Cohasset and Weymouth, Jim, so thank you for mentioning that. Uh, it will be on the Hingham League of Women Voters website, that is lwvhingham.org, and also shown on Harbor Media TV. So we will leave you with a slide of resources for further information on rate choice voting. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for everyone for joining us. Thank you, Celia.